Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. This is the Bloomberg Surveillance Podcast. I'm Jonathan Farrow, along with Lisa Abramowitz and Anne-Marie Hordern. Join us each day for insight from the best in markets, economics and geopolitics. From our global headquarters in New York City, we are live on Bloomberg Television weekday mornings from 6 to 9 a.m. Eastern. Subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify or anywhere else you listen. And as always, on the Bloomberg Terminal and the Bloomberg Business App. Michael Hurston of 22V Research writing this. The trade and investment relationship remains under strain, particularly on tech-related issues. The intense geopolitical rivalry and domestic politics in each country limit the room for active cooperation. Michael, I'm pleased to say, is with us now for more. Michael, let's get straight into it. What is at the top of the agenda for Janet Yellen on this trip? Well, I think for the U.S. side, it's definitely this issue of excess capacity or really, you know, China's uh, very aggressive focus on promoting advanced manufacturing, particularly in some of the same strategic sectors that the Biden administration is focused on. So electric vehicles, uh, solar energy, that is top of the U.S. agenda. And it's a trade issue, but it's also a macro issue for global growth. And I think that's one reason why it's Janet Yellen delivering this message and not necessarily U.S. trade officials. That's definitely top of the top of the of the priority list for the U.S. Michael, when I was reading uh, and listening to what Janet Yellen had to say, I kept thinking, what's the distinction and how big is the distinction between decoupling and enforcing a level playing field? I think for Treasury Secretary Yellen, there is a big distinction in the sense that I I honestly think, you know, as a trained economist, uh, that she believes that trade is good um, and that uh, she wants to deliver a message that the U.S. does not seek to decouple. Now, that's kind of a controversial view in the U.S. and I think to some extent even within the Biden administration. But um, generally speaking, I think she is trying to say we want to have trade, um, but we need to address what on the U.S. side is considered these distortions coming from China's manufacturing sector. A lot of the focus has been on green energy and the supplies that are needed to really uh, push forward the entire platform by the Biden administration. How much are the Biden administration's hands tied in a way? Because they are looking to shift toward certain types of technologies that require metals and technologies that are dominated by China. It's a very difficult balancing act. And um, I think it, you know, it somewhat depends on the sector. It's something like solar. China's cost advantages are just so extreme at this point that you know, it's very difficult to, to meaningfully um, you know, decouple from China or take really aggressive actions in the solar sector. Uh, and something like electric vehicles, you know, it's a bit more nuanced, but I think that is the balance that they have to face. And again, it's one reason why Janet Yellen is out there, instead of just slapping additional tariffs on these items, um, really the solution for both sides should be to try to work on some kind of accommodation to address the concerns on, on each side. She alluded to tariffs, though, yesterday. She said, I wouldn't want to rule out other possible ways in which we would protect them, talking about clean energy. Where does the U.S. stand right now? Where is that tariff review? Um, That's a good question. There is a tariff review that's been underway. And, uh, you know, we've heard numerous times that, you know, it would be out, uh, for example, at the end of last year. Um, I think... Frankly, it's unlikely that we're going to see any really aggressive moves, certainly to lower tariffs. And it is possible that we're going to see moves to increase some of those tariffs. Um, Perhaps we would lower them on some of the consumer items that aren't strategic coming from China. But I think tariffs are going to remain part of the toolkit, especially on an area like electric vehicles, when you see this export surge that's showing up. Um, in Europe, but not showing up in the U.S. And I think trade officials in the U.S. are going to want to keep it that way. That's the one we're looking for. Michael, thank you, sir. Michael Hurston there. John Bavan of BlackRock remaining bullish, writing this. We think upbeat risk appetite can broaden out beyond tech as more sectors adopt AI. More broadly, rising and volatile yields have not disrupted the push higher in developed market equities. That's consistent with our view. The mega forces such as AI are key drivers of returns now. John, I'm pleased to say, joins us now for more. John, we'll get to the stock market in just a moment. I just want your views on Chairman Powell yesterday. Given the economic data we've seen so far, would you describe some of those data points as just bumps in the road in the same way the chairman has? 
Well, I think this is this is a long road. So um, uh, if I look at the, the, the first stretch of that road, I think it's a bump. So we think inflation is going to be showing progress towards two over the next few months. Uh, the Fed is data dependent. They are not forward looking. So they're going to be lured into uh, we've sold inflation. That's going to be the story. That's part of the reason why we are kind of uh, rip pro constructive on risk for now. Um, and I think uh, I think that's going to be the story. They'll cut. This is a Fed that is um, boxed himself in December to be uh, to, to cut at some point this year, some point soon. I think the bar not to do that is pretty high. I mean, we can debate whether this is the right stance. Um, but uh, it is a stance. So as a result, um, a, a bit of progress on inflation will cut the narrative for them that uh, there's bumps and they'll they'll be in a position to cut. So I think that's the story for the next few months. And that's why uh, risk assets are set to continue to perform. John, the story we've had over the last few days, really, is how to interpret the moves in bonds, the moves in commodities with regard to equities. How are you interpreting those moves? Yeah, I think the uh, well, the first point to make is uh, you, you, uh, we, we very much believe we're in a new regime, right? So we're pro-risk right now. I think this has room to uh, to continue, room to run, but it's it's a very different environment. The idea that we're going back to uh, through immaculate dif- disinflation to the great moderation of the pre-pandemic, I think is uh, is not happening. And I think when you look at the bond volatility that we're seeing, uh, it continues. Uh, that was clearly the case of 2023, but like even this week massive i think that's the biggest evidence we have that this is not uh you know back to the old regime uh so i think we're seeing um you know a lot of volatility macro narrative it takes a little bit of info data to come in to lead to very significant reaction as we've seen and then uh, lo and behold uh, we're at the same point as we were like a week ago before the pce in terms of uh, fed expectations the only thing that has really changed is long-term rates that are set uh, at a higher level now so I think it speaks to this environment where we can very much see the Fed starting to cut, but at the same time, uh, don't expect long-term rates to follow suit and, uh, and and move down. I think we can very much see, uh, you know, a Fed that starts to cut rates. It's going to be only a couple anyway, and then we're going to at the same time see rates that uh, are stable, long-term rates that are stable, or even go higher from here. Which is the reason why you've been focusing on the short end of the yield curve. We had John Solfis earlier this morning on who said that, that stocks could continue to rally as long as 10-year Treasury yields didn't reach 6%. Do you agree with that, that if we had 10-year Treasury yields north of 10%, that would not be, or north of 5%, excuse me, that that would not be a problem for equity valuations? Uh, no, I, 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 I wish that's the case, but I... Um I find it hard to uh, to uh, to relax about this. So uh, I think if we were really of the view that uh, we're going to six in the short order, like over the next year, six percent, ten year, it's very difficult to see uh, equity that uh, sailed through this. So uh, and we I think we've seen some evidence of that. Right, the, go back to October of last uh, 2023, last year, uh, we went uh, north of five percent, and uh, that was a very different narrative. Felt very different. Um, so, I mean, over a course of 10 years, uh, we might reset to a higher rate environment and realize that we can uh, we can live with that. But I think uh, the, the, the journey there will be one where equities will will uh, will feel more than bumpy. When people talk about a new regime, a lot of guests who've come on surveillance talk about their investments in the energy sector, as well as just commodities in general, that any AI adoption has to come with hard uh, infrastructure investments that have not been fully accounted for. How much is BlackRock kind of adhering to that and really overweighting a host of commodities? So the, uh, the, there is a, a, a massive uh, restructuring of the economy that is happening. We think there's, a, there's AI is one big piece of it, but uh, we, we see five big mega forces. Uh, demographics is going to lead to a big change in spending pattern in developed economies. Uh, the rewiring of geop- geopolitics means that we have a, a different uh, organization globally that uh, requires adjustment, infrastructure. Um, we have uh, the transition, the new transition, and we think finance is restructuring itself as well. So big, big trends. All of them uh, require adjustment, and these adjustments, I think, have to involve some kind of uh, very significant investment. I mean, if you only take the transition, the energy, the energy transition, that's by itself uh, you know, a huge amount of investment. I think AI is in the middle and interacting with that. So, uh, yeah, I think infrastructure is a huge part of the, year, the story of the year to come. Uh, even if you don't have, like, very you know, bullish growth expectations. Uh, we still need a lot of investment, infrastructure investment. So, um, and yes, that's going to support commodities. I think it's harder to 
draw a link to uh, this need for investment and what it's going to mean for commodities. I think it's a much more complex story, uh, but there is ultimately uh, we're going to be drawing more on commodities as we uh, as we uh, deliver on these investments. You mentioned this changing geopolitical map. We have the Secretary of the Treasury over in China, and, and she's talking about that they don't want to completely decouple from China. It's just about diversifying. Do you buy that? And if it was to be a decouple, how does that change your thesis? Well, I think decoupling, complete decoupling, is is uh, even 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 if that was the objective, is not realistic, right? I mean, we're we're intertwined in very fundamental ways globally, uh, and so um, you know, fully decoupling will will not will, will not even be on the table. So I think I don't see necessarily a lot of information in a comment like this, right? I mean, it's uh, it's kind of a a straw man that is unachievable. Uh, but there is a trend. I think the most important thing for me is that we are fragmenting. Uh, there is a there's a distanciation that is happening. Uh, the question is, how is it going to be navigated? But in the meantime, uh, aside from the politics and those trips, I think investors are uh, uh, investors and companies globally are adjusting and making plans that are accounting for the fact that the world will be uh, more fragmented than it was. And I think that's a big that's one of the big mega forces that is happening uh, and is affecting decision even as we speak. John, if that's the case, do I want to have a bias towards small caps away from multi cap multinational big caps? Uh, I mean, you could you could uh, eventually see uh, see that, that that logic playing out. I think for now we still think that uh, you know more from a tactical basis uh, that you would need to have a more conviction on a, on a, you know a growth spur that uh, is lasting more than a few months to start to broaden your views on small caps. I think that's going to be more of a story about the near-term growth than it is about fragmentation. But if you think on a ten-year basis, then I can very well see. Uh, you know, a story where you see more localized uh, companies, uh, smaller cap, small caps uh, being beneficiaries of this uh, geopolitical mega force. That's one to watch. Jean, you're one of the best, sir. Thank you. Jean Bavan there of BlackRock. to discuss the labor market is Becky Frankowitz, the Chief Commercial Officer and North America President at Manpower Group. Becky, wonderful to catch up with you. One thing we love to do with you is talk about what's happening with temp workers, the shift between temp workers and permanent hires. Can you talk us through how that's evolved as the year has progressed? Yes, yeah, so normally coming out of a recovery or into a recovery out of a recession, you would see employers want the flexibility of temp workers. So that's a measure called temp penetration. We would see that increase. We have seen that below 2%, which 2% is the average, consistently, and we're starting to see even further declines in temp penetration. However, the offset of that is we're seeing permanent hiring continue to be strong, which definitely reinforces two things. One, employers are still hiring. And two, there's a bit of post-pandemic hangover where employers couldn't find the talent that they want. And so they're scared not to grab them and make them permanent employees. And so that, that will be a number I'm watching tomorrow, what's happening in tent penetration. Uh, but PERM will definitely be strong. Becky, did that make it difficult to read into where we are in the cycle? Are those traditional indicators broken because of this approach post pandemic? Yes, I would say the human behavior has now come into the algorithms that everyone is using. And it's very difficult to predict where we are in a cycle given that. However, again, the resilience of this labor market, John, is just amazing. We continue to see strong numbers. If we see a 213 or a 250 tomorrow, I wouldn't be surprised anywhere in between, which, which definitely demonstrates a very resilient labor market. It also highlights the sort of rolling recovery and rolling recessions within the labor market, as well as in the broader economy. Where are you expecting the jobs to be added? For a while, it was more focused in the services sectors and the uh, sort of people-facing areas that had gotten hardest hit during the pandemic. Are we seeing that shift to some of the areas that have been left behind of late, in particular middle managers and other types of professionals? Yeah, so BLS, the, the jobs numbers, look in the rearview mirror. We're looking at real-time data every day in terms of demand for jobs in the country. And we're seeing increased demand in affordable experiences. I like to call it that. Um, think hospitality and leisure is where it shows up. But the biggest hires in the, com the country today, the biggest employers looking for, for labor are Walgreens, Family Dollar, um, Great Clips, the Hair Clip franchise, you know, so consumers seeking affordable experiences and companies then needing to hire. So that's one. Another is tech continues to be strong. Software developers are the number two job most in demand in the country. And AI machine learning, which you spoke about a bit earlier on the show, continues to set records 
week over week, month over month in terms of demand. So big demand for AI machine learning engineers specifically. Becky, is there anything that you're seeing on the ground that coheres with this idea of a sudden fall off in demand for workers that could happen within the next six months? Yeah, I don't think we're going to see a sudden fall off. Uh, if anything, I think the word of the year is stabilization. We're seeing a bit of rebalancing from the post-pandemic highs and lows. Um, employers are taking a more measured approach in terms of who they're hiring, again, tending towards PERM. And employees are staying put. I mean, we're seeing the quit rate really level off. And as, as you alluded to in the jobless claims today, we're not seeing layoffs spike either. And so people are staying put. Companies are holding on to their workers for the most part. And we're starting to see some, some evenness in terms of demand, some stabilization, I would call it. I don't anticipate a drop off. If anything, the PMI going above 50, um, I'm hoping to see some expansion, particularly in skilled trades in manufacturing. I want to lean into that AI competition that you're seeing in the labor market, because Elon Musk, as we said earlier, called it the craziest he's ever seen. How difficult actually is to attract that talent that can fill this industry that's fueling the stock market? Well, I think first the question is, is the talent available? So attracting the talent is incredibly difficult because we don't have enough AI machine learning engineers, the, the population of skill isn't, isn't large enough. So we have to upskill and reskill people into those jobs. Um, but it is a very, very hot market. And let's just take a minute to define what in the world is an AI machine learning engineer. Um, they're the people that write the algorithms. They do the user interface so that we as users can you know, log in and chat GPT and it's a, it's a, a, a usable platform. Um, so that's the kind of skill we're looking for. Um, a lot of data analytics, programming experience. Um, that's what you need to have adjacent skills to upskill into the AI machine learning engineers. Becky, not to weigh into the political sphere, but I am curious what you make of what Jerome Powell said yesterday about immigration and how much that has contributed to a robust labor market without sort of commensurate inflation. How much are you seeing that within your world in terms of new immigrants, legal or not, taking up jobs that then uh, really keep wages more reasonable, I guess, for the, work, for the uh, employers and uh, potentially not rising as much for the workers? Yeah, I thought it was a very provocative point of view. Um, I'm not sure we're, you know, we're not seeing that. We only hire people who, you know, are, are legal, able to work in the country. Um, but we do believe in immigration because we we see that the structural economy has changed. We don't have enough workers. And so we don't have enough skilled workers, but we don't have enough workers. And so that that would be our point of view is we would support, you know, anybody who can work. We want to have them access to work. Um, but in terms of what is that got, you know, hiding in the numbers, I, I think it goes back to the old algorithms aren't holding in this recovery. And it's one of the reasons that I would push on the Fed when we say they're waiting for the labor market to, to decline in order to cut rates. The old algorithms aren't holding. And I think I would, we probably should explore that a bit. Hey, Becky, wonderful to explore it with you. Thank you. Becky Frankowitz there of Manpower Group. This is the Bloomberg Surveillance Podcast, bringing you the best in markets, economics and geopolitics. You can watch the show live on Bloomberg TV weekday mornings from 6am to 9am Eastern. Subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify or anywhere else you listen. And as always on the Bloomberg Terminal and the Bloomberg Business App.